Hi, Heidi. Were you just in the last session I was in? Yes, I thought so. <laughs> You're almost faster than me. Um, hi, Richard. Hi, how are you, Pam? I'm good. How are you doing? Hanging in there. <laughs> I'm glad it's Friday. Yeah, me too. Oh, man. I just wish it was Friday with all of us together. I know, right? Yeah. Saying that to uh, actually Brent earlier, because Brent and I always connect and have a long chat every time we're at these conferences. I'm like, oh, we haven't, it's been like a year and a half and we email each other and see each other. It's, it's like, there's, cert there's certain people that, you know, you haven't seen now in two years. Cause it's like, oh, anyways, it's rough. Yeah. I'm tired of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, me too. Yeah. You have those moments of like last week was my, I was like, this is it. I'm done. I'm, I'm back this week. I'm like, okay, I can keep doing this, but oh. Yeah, that was us earlier this week. My brother was going to come up and I was going to see my nephew and hang out with my nephew and my brother and his wife. And then they put the extra travel restrictions on. And it's like, <laughs> this week we had it planned for like two. Oh, it was painful. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen my brother since last summer. It's, yeah. It's very sad. Yeah. Uh, Richard, are you planning on using breakout rooms or anything? I am. Yeah. Okay. I need to make you so do you want me to manage the breakout rooms or do you want me to make you host? Can you make me host? Because that I yeah. I can. I'm used to that and I'm I make you host. Am I still gonna be co-host? Control freak can kind of take over <laughs> for me. Um, I don't even know if I need to be well the only maybe if you make are you me still host? host. No, you're host now. Okay. Let's see. Can you make now, make cool now I want a little bit of power. Okay, sure. there. <laughs> um, just because then I can control some other, you know, mics or something. Should we need it though? It's no, that's great. Not really. That's helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah. In case someone forgets to mute, because that does happen, as we all know. Yeah, happened to the best of us, I think. And is there anything else I can help you with right now? If not, I'm gonna take, okay. I thought you'd be pretty. Good. I'm just gonna run and refresh my water, et cetera. I'll be mm -hmm. right back. Thanks, Ben. Welcome everybody who's coming in. Good to see you. Hopefully you came from a good session.
Hi, Tony. If any of you are actually using StudyForge today, you get to meet Tony, who you probably emailed with a hundred times. She is our amazing client success manager. Yes, by all means, if anyone has any questions or wants to reach out to me or just say hi, I would love to hear from you. While we're waiting, I have some fun here as people are starting to pop into the room. Oh, I was just going to ask. I'm like, oh, are you going to post those little school things? They were so funny yesterday. Every one of these kids, I would give 100% to. They're my favorites. <laughs> if nothing else, for creativity and thinking outside the box. And boldness for some of them. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out this one. This one gets me because the age of the student based on the writing, the writing looks like my six or seven year old. I mean, yeah, my about my six, seven, eight year olds looks about like they're printing. But I, I couldn't think of my kids using that word freeloader. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Um, I like the clarity of that. It's very concise. Yeah. Oh, welcome to everybody who's jumping in here. Great to see everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feel free to camera on and unmute so you can join us in laughing at um, smart children. While we're waiting to get started here. Smart and smart. <clears throat> Hi, Tom. <laughs> I don't know why the teacher didn't like this one. Yeah, I mean, no, that's like, true. Like, I feel like that teacher needs a hug or something. Yeah. <laughs> Going through a breakup, perhaps. Just no comment. Just right through hard no. red pen <laughs> absolutely not this one totally made me howl. <laughs> that's my kind of math for sure <laughs> oh yeah this one's good <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should not hate dogs. Although sometimes. You have to end on a positive one. Oh, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. See, and this teacher at least gave them some kudos. That's. <laughs> That's yeah. Great. Well, we, I think, uh, are you pretty much ready to go there, Richard? I'm ready. All right. Well, I would like to welcome everybody to this session and certainly my pleasure to introduce Richard and I am so looking forward to uh, what we're going to learn together here with you. So I will just hand it over, take it away. Thanks, Pam. Awesome, excited to jump in here. Um, uh, we're gonna have uh, just warning ahead of time. We're gonna end this one with um, input from you guys and um, uh, breakout rooms where we'll discuss this kind of at our tables and then bring those discussions back so that um, we can benefit from the knowledge of the room. And it's a great format that I think helps. So we wanna keep this interactive as well. So I'm gonna go pretty quick, um, but we'll post um, 
the slides and some of the key links and some of the resources here uh, in the document as well. So I'm just gonna, before we get too far in, take the uh, collaborative note that. sharing that. thing and put in the chat. So that's there. Um, so you guys can jump in there and we'll even be adding stuff in here potentially even after the session, so. Awesome, okay, so six steps to improving one-on-one -on -one meetings with your online students. So if you're here in the session, it's probably because you sometimes meet with kids one-on-one -on -one online and um, as is an amazing thing that we get to do in online learning and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So let's dive in. Uh, baseball is a very difficult game. They say hitting a baseball is the most difficult thing to do in professional sports. Now I loved it growing up and while I was a decent fielder, hitter and base runner, I never did learn how to throw properly. Fast forward 20 years and now I coach my three boys in little league. And my goodness, I'm thinking how times have changed. See, when I was growing up, uh, my dad was coaching me. And, you know, when he was growing up, his dad coached him. And when he was growing up, believe it or not, his dad coached him. <laughs> and so um, back in those times, no one had the internet. And this just kind of struck me one day as I was working with and coaching my kids. Um, we, it, it was so different. And I realized, man, little league sports have changed. So this is a, this next slot here. I'm going to just hit play on a little video here. Um, oh, I forgot to share my sound, but this is a video of my son who went to a baseball camp here in Kelowna. And right now there's a voiceover of a professional pitcher who played in the major leagues, who has slow motion video of my son and is breaking down his throw. This is my 11 year old's pitching throw. And he's walking him through and he's drawing little diagrams and graphs of telling him, hey, adjust this down to like the degrees of um, rotation and where his arm positions are at and the height of his leg lift in relation to all these things. And it's just like, when I was watching this video the other day, I just, I just had to stop and put my phone down and go, this is wild. <laughs> There's a major league pitcher coaching my son um, over, uh, you know, over this online learning thing. And uh, it was, I mean, it's just cool. It's interesting. And uh, one of the things that they're teaching them is how to not get injured. All of this whole program is how to be able to throw 100,000 pitches without getting injured in the meantime. And so they actually rated each kid and gave them a score of here, your, your, expect, your expectation of injury is after 70,000 pitches. Yours is after 120,000 pitches because of your, the range of your um, throw and where your arms are at and all those kinds of things. So it's all to, designed to help kids um, not get injured and become better throwers. These are two of my other boys. And um, the thing that I love about coaching and, and the thing that I really enjoy about baseball is that every kid is just so unbelievably unique. Now these two boys are actually my two boys. They're on the same team this year. And this was on a play where um, they're rounding third base. And yes, my one child is catching up to and actually passed my, my younger child here in this game uh, because he hit the ball and, and chased around. So this one here on the left in the red helmet, he's an extremely competitive, really focused into it, intense kid. My uh, third uh, oldest son, my youngest son is um, the one building the sandcastles uh, out <laughs> by second base. And each of them needs something completely different. Yeah, they're both having a blast. We're all having a ton of fun this day. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but the thing about baseball that I love is that you have all these kids at different places, at different states on their journey, and every single one of them needs something different and unique. So as we think about improving our one-on-one -on -one meetings with our students, I think a ton about coaching, um, partially because, well, now you know that uh, one of my passions is coaching and is sports and helping kids grow in sports and helping them see them improve. But what, what I'm fascinated by is the fact that they all need something different. So as I'm watching kids throw and we're going around and I've now learned because of the internet how to actually throw properly in my old age, um, I can now help kids do that and I can see their throw and I take slow motion videos of them and help them and reflect back with them. So this is gonna play into our discussion today about one-on-one -on -one meetings because I want us to think about it as a chance to um, think of ourselves as a coach, as a learning coach, with each student that we get to have these meetings with and that we get to engage with. So let's dive in and here's six steps, six ways to uh, improve those meetings. So step one is to actually initiate contact. Be the first one to reach out to every student. The way that I do this and we recommend doing this 
is having a first meeting as part of your built-in course design in your learning management system. So have this a requirement to move on, either as a completion requirement or as um, something that you give a uh, uh, assessment grade for or something that literally just sits in there as a completion requirement to move on into the course. Um, have this kind of a meeting there. Now, what do you do in that first meeting? Well, I would use it to introduce myself and I would use it to get to know the students. And I would always trick them into turning their camera on because then all of a sudden we realize, hey, there's two people here. And the way that I would do that is I would say that it's a requirement that we ask for a picture ID and I need to just, hey, make sure that you're here and you're part of the course because you know what, it's an online course and sometimes people try to impersonate other people. We don't wanna do that. So can you just verify like who you are and go grab your student ID or your um, picture ID and show me so I can just see who you are. And then all of a sudden their camera's on and now they're engaged with me and we can have a conversation like, to real people as much as we can. It was interesting hearing in the keynote this morning, different people's ideas on how to get the camera to turn on. Here was my idea. So here's a little, um, uh, I'm gonna paste this in the, in the shared collaborative notes right now. This little link here, which is a template, a possible template that you can use, take, grab, it's a Google, shareable Google slide of just what an initial meeting might look like. And so you can, as you can see here, just get to know them, um, take that picture of them, ask them some history about the kind of content of the course you're in. Is English something that they absolutely hate? That's a good piece of information to know in that first meeting before they go into the course. And, um, you know, ask them how the first few lessons are gone, if they have any questions and just get to know them and, and start that supportive atmosphere. Let them know that they have a coach, a coach in their corner um, ready to help them out. So that's that first step. Step one is initiate contact. And so steps one through three kind of fit in one category steps four through five fit in another one. Step two is to actually become familiar to your students. So when I'm coaching on the field, um, when kids are warming up and when we're doing things, we talk and we encourage them to talk. And we talk about our lives too and tell them about the things that we did, what we liked about sports growing up, the things that we're good at, the things that we're bad at, and just sharing with them um, as much as we can. So I shared about this in my session yesterday a little bit about being everywhere in the course. Well, another tool that you can do is to have a weekly communication. So um, this, I got a story from a colleague who did that just every week, she would share kind of what was going on in her learning journey. What are some things that are happening in her life? What are some challenges she had? How is she dealing with COVID? What are the things that are going on? It's just a little short one paragraph, kind of like a little curated journal reflection, not too open, not oversharing but just talking about where they're at, what their um, experiences was. And the amazing thing was, she was going along doing this and, and at one point was kind of discouraged and going, is this even a point? Nobody really references it. How is this helpful? And um, uh, three quarters of the way through the year, she had a student reach out to her who was actually in crisis and in need. And she had built a, a capacity for um, trust with her students, even though they weren't responding back, even though they weren't there, they were reading those posts. <laughs> And, um, and here was a student that reached out to her that then the school was able to put in a student at risk assessment and you know, potentially was able to be really positive impact in that student's life because of this situation, because that person was familiar. So if you're familiar to your students, they can reference things about your most recent um, post that you did in those one-on-one -on -one meetings that you're having with them if you're familiar with your students. A talk I would vastly highly recommend watching is Brene Brown's um, Power of Vulnerability talk. She's given this talk, to, I think about 15 million people have viewed this, one of the most popular TED Talks ever, um, blew up the internet, but it's unbelievably um, uh, powerful to just kind of hear how the power of vulnerability creates a space where people can feel welcome. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, and again, there is such a thing as oversharing. So we don't want to overshare. We don't want to let students into aspects of our lives that are inappropriate for us to have in a professional situation. But sharing how we're on a learning journey as well as with them um, is a really powerful thing. So think of ways that you can become familiar with your students. And one practical way to do that is through a weekly communication um, that's, that is going to make your one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions even better. Okay, step three is get informed. So this is a shot of um, a Moodle gradebook that um, you know, has all of your comments. You should know how to get here really fast. And you should have this bookmarked for each of your courses so that in 10 seconds, 
you can be on this page for your student and see all the comments you've given them in um, whatever learning management system that you use. Um, I've advocated before in different sessions and things, and I'll um, talk about some resources that you can see this, about keeping some kind of a journal. This is a journal that um, a colleague of mine, actually my wife, keeps with her students, and she uses a tool called Trello to do that, which is a online project management software. And the cool thing that she uses Trello for is that it can send her a reminder to reach out to her students, but she's keeping a journal about everything that her students are doing as she goes throughout the year. So I highly recommend having a journal about your students. Have your first initial face-to-face um, -face meeting document there as well in your student notes. And then finally, um, in if you're using a tool like StudyForge that has analytics about the student's engagement and behavior in the course, how engaged are they? What have they watched? What have they not watched? Have be able to get to that quickly as well. So. Think about this before you have a meeting with your student if you take 20 to 30 seconds if you're quick you can do this in less than a minute you can be on all the pages you can review that student look at their picture again go who was this person um have your notes there have your moodle grade book have their progress in um study forge or a tool like that if you're using that for your content and have that review done because now you're actually going into that meeting completely informed with where the students are at. Now, I cover a lot of this in a previous session I've given called Five Secrets to Being More Proactive. So here's a shameless plug um, <laughs> about some of those ideas. Uh, go to our website, studyforge.net, and just for this conference, if you go to DLSIM21 and download this today, you'll get entered to win um, before the end of the conference by two o'clock. If you go there, you'll be entered to win a gift card and you get a free PDF with a ton of resources. So, um, yeah, back to that. So in StudyForge, we made it again really quickly. Um, you can literally just click up here in the corner, start typing a student's name, and you can hit enter and you're on that student's report. So it's literally two seconds to get to a student's report. Um, we've tried to make it really that easy. So get informed is step number three. So have everything open, then jump into your meeting with your student and get quick at it. If you can do it in um, a minute, then you're uh, in a minute or less, then you can do it in between sessions with your students. So those are three things that you can do before any meeting. Now we're going to talk about mindsets in the meeting um, with your students that will make you a more effective coach. Um, mindset number one is be intensely curious. And uh, one of the things that um, both as an online teacher and now um, working with StudyForge and working um, in supporting online teachers is that I get to meet a ton of people. And um, one of the thing about people, every single person I've met is intensely interesting. <laughs> so because of that, I like to be intensely curious because everyone has a story. Everyone has unique things about them. And the more time that you spend with them, um, if you don't find someone interesting, you're probably not paying attention or haven't just asked the right question yet because every single person has, is uniquely interesting in and of themselves. They have those stories, they have those things. And so um, as you're being curious, <coughs> excuse me, um, the, key, the key way to be curious is just to ask questions, then ask more questions and follow up your questions with questions. Uh, and so if you have a meeting with a student, I would spend, if you can, at least half of the time asking questions and then you might, to have the other half of the time um, uh, to be effectively giving coaching and direction and help. Now, what do I mean by this? Um, there's, what we, what we want to do is di keep digging deeper until you're at the point where you know where the student is truly at. So let me use a math question as an example here. So student comes to me and says, Mr. Bickett, I'm struggling with question X. Um, the more questions that I ask, I can discover whether this is an issue with this specific question or whether this is an issue with an underlying concept that builds up to that. Um, sometimes it builds um, up to the fact that the student isn't actually engaging in good work habits, or sometimes it comes to the fact that the student doesn't have mental capacity for math because of some other situation or something that's going on at home. So as much as feels natural, and I get that sometimes, yeah, thanks, Cheryl, that's a great comment. Sometimes it can feel um, like you're being nosy, but if you're, if, if the student, if you've done the things before now, <laughs> again, that's why it's important to set up these meetings for success where they know and trust that, hey, you're here, you're in this for them, you want them to succeed. Then when you're coming into those coachable moments, you are, um, 
you have a better chance to get to the root issue of the thing that needs to be dealt with. So in math for me, usually when I was working with students, it was not an issue with the question in lesson five. It was actually an issue with two years ago and their understanding of how to work with fractions or not having a good conceptual uh, understanding of integers or the number line or something deeper or root issue. And so the thing is, I might never get back to the question in the time I have a lot with that student. But if I can go deep and solve an underlying conceptual issue or go deep and discover that um, this student has a really bad work habit or doesn't know how to even um, articulate their work into their um, uh, questions, then I'm going to be more beneficial in working with them. So that's that curiosity of going deeper and covering less is going to be um, uh, better, which is my next point here as well, after being intensely curious, is to adjust your expectations. Because if you're going to do that, um, this might be your plan. Student will come to my session, I will help them, they will succeed. And what it actually looks like is probably something like this. <laughs> um, you know, there's going to be ups and downs and journeys and pitfalls and you realize, oh yeah, it's not this. Or, you know, the student isn't even going to be with me today. So maybe all I can do today is encourage them so that tomorrow they're, they'll be willing to come back. <laughs> maybe that's all I'm going to get to today. So, and not just adjusting your expectations. I said adjust expectations in general because we might need to adjust student expectations as well because they might have the view that um, I'm gonna, they're gonna go from A to Z and you realize there's no way we're getting from A to Z until we overcome this pitfall you know, back here in C or D. And so be willing to go into any one-on-one -on -one meeting where a student is like, hey, I need help with my assignment you might not even get to the assignment because we need to go back on something else and it's worth it. That's okay. In the long run, it's worth it to dig deeper on a few things rather than stay shallow on many things. And this, um, again, come back to baseball. When I'm working with a kid on their throw, they might struggle and say, hey, I wanna throw faster and that's fine. But if you throw faster this way, you're actually gonna hit a cap. So we actually need to go back three steps and build up your throw from the ground up and it's gonna be awkward and painful. And in three weeks, then you're gonna be back to this place and we can come and deal with this thing. But you're not gonna get injured <laughs> and you're gonna actually be able to throw eventually down in the long run like I never learned how to. So there's that vulnerability. This one is the scariest one. So number six, um, ask for feedback. Now I'm gonna give you like a practical way that you can um, do this with your students. And uh, uh, <laughs> this is scary. And the question is, how humble can we be? Are we willing to let our students coach us? Are we willing to say, you know, have them reflect and give us feedback on things, knowing that we have to take all this with a grain of salt. But one tool that you could have is to create a Google form with these questions. Really simple. How helpful was our session today? Not helpful, somewhat helpful, very helpful. What do you feel more confident about after the session? what could have gone better in this session. So you're not actually asking them to rate you in these questions that we're giving you here. Um, and again, we'll drop these into the uh, template after the, drop this into the shared notes doc after the meeting today. Um, but if you send this to every student after every session, which is um, something that uh, we started doing with uh, some staff that I was working with at one point, um, it was really fantastic, the feedback that came back. It's encouraging because a lot of times things go well and it's nice to actually give students a chance to make that explicit other than just saying, okay, goodbye. Um, the other thing is, is that you can learn things and you can go, man, that didn't go well. Um, or I thought that went great and the student didn't. And that's the most important thing because you might think that something went fantastic and the students might think it absolutely did not. And they were really frustrated and they're holding back the onions until, um, you hit, they hit end on the meeting. So those are things to um, keep in mind that's helpful to do if you're willing to have that feedback. Now, finally, there's a number seven and I know it's called the six steps. Now this isn't actually to, um, step seven is to have boundaries and this is just for you, this is a freebie. And this is not, um, uh, this is not necessarily going to result in better meetings, but if we're healthier, we're going to have better meetings. And specifically around our availability to students, I think it's really, really, really important that we have boundaries. So here are some suggestions for that. Um, don't respond to emails 24 seven, batch your email time. This is just my advice to everybody in the world, everywhere, uh, who ever has to function with email. Um, if you, uh, if you, you can train your students how you will treat them. And so if you are responding to emails 
right away when they come in. Or if you're apologizing, um, this is something that I was just talking with another teacher about a few or, or heard about another teacher gave a session that I was a part of um, earlier in the week. Um, and they said if they had the urge to want to apologize if it had been four or five hours after a student's email and, you know, said, oh, I'm sorry for taking so long. Or if it's the next day, I'm sorry for taking so long. But, you know, if it's within the defined window that your school says is a good response time, if it's within, you know, next business day is usually what's expected for email, then don't apologize. <laughs> because if you apologize and they're saying, yeah, I should have expected that email sooner. So anyways, sorry. Um, email is a pet peeve of mine. And so have boundaries around your email and batch your email time so that you're not training students that you're constantly available to them. And uh, once a lot of people argue to have a schedule of availability, I argue to have a schedule of unavailability. Have times that you are not available to your students. Have times that they know that you're not there. Um, have scheduled office hours, M most of us do, et cetera. But use a scheduling app to set bounds on meeting times. This one I think is important. Um, I've seen teachers use things like Calendly or You Can Book Me. These are great resources um, that you can uh, use to block. So students have, you know, a 10 minute section or a 15 minute section. And these are really smart too. So you can have students come and book a 10 minute or a 15 minute slot and then have it so that it always leaves a five minute break in between students. So if someone books 10 minutes, your calendar gets blocked out for 15. Um, and the cool thing about that is that you can have that then five minute break. Um, if, you know, one student goes a little bit later, then you can have some time for the next, but it helps bound those sessions and those times. Um, for your students and have some, uh, uh, so you can have that, that space to switch from one student to the next. And again, go back and get informed on your next meeting. So if you have that one to two minute break in between some meeting times, then you can have that time to go back to step number two, which was get informed. And lastly, um, I just wanna encourage everyone with this one, don't be a rock star teacher. They're bad for education. And this may sound like, again, somewhat um, controversial, blasphemous even, when it comes to um, uh, uh, an education conference. But I, I just dropped a fantastic article put out by the DLC. It's actually um, a link to a couple articles and the feedback on those. So drop in and there's, there's an article written um, about the, how rockstar teachers are a problem for education. And I think it's, we can come to these education conferences and see all these things that we could add or should do or need to fill in or throw into our time and into our um, spaces. Um, and then if you actually talk to teach the, you know, certain people who do these things, you ask how, how, what does your life actually look like? And it's like, well, you know, I work four hours every night when I get home from the office and I build the things for the next day. And on weekends, I'm putting in all this time. You realize, oh, the reason why you can do all these fantastic things is because you work 80 to 90 hours a week <laughs> for school. Now that's, great for them, but is that sustainable for all of us? Is that a sustainable way or an expectation for us to have on our teachers? And so this is just, hey, sometimes we need to have permission, especially, you know, as we're nearing the end of a conference to go, I don't have to be a rock star and do everything. And um, that's just, it's an article to encourage us and to give to your um, supervisors and <laughs> um, people to advocate for, hey, there's only so much that we can ask of teachers. And we're always asked, um, there's so much asked of us in this um, in this profession, in this field. And so have boundaries, don't be a rock star teacher. Um, and so take everything I said before with a grain of salt. And it, hopefully you saw that we're trying to give you practical tools that you can build in that don't add more um, time or effort, but just make your, your, the time that you do have with your students in those coaching sessions more effective. So um, where are we here? Yeah, so those are six steps with a bonus. Let's just review them and go through one more time. Initiate contact. Um, initiate contact. Build a first meeting into the structure of your course. Make that part of your course. Become familiar to your students. Do a weekly post. And um, we're sharing what you're learning and growing and what your interests are so that the students um, have that rapport built up with you. Get informed. Have all of your notes, grades, engagement data, everything reviewed immediately before the meeting so it's fresh in your mind. Have it available so you can have that as a reference when you're having those meetings with your students. Then in the meeting itself, be intensely curious, ask more and more questions, adjust your expectations, lower them, lower your expectations. It's okay to lower expectations. <laughs> Sorry, side note, I often get asked, my, my wife and I have five children and this year we're homeschooling for the first time, taking some of our own medicine here as um, online teachers. Uh, and yet we're both still working full-time from home 
And we moved this year to a smaller house right before COVID hit because we're like, oh, we don't need all this space. Our kids go to school every day. And so now we're in a smaller house, both working from home, fighting for the little bits of office space that we have. This also shares doubles as my daughter's bedroom. So um, people will say, how do you do it? And they say, it's really easy. You just lower your expectations. Um, that's how we survive. You just don't have to have things as awesome as you would think that they should be based on people's Instagram and Twitter. So um, I don't do social media, but if I did, I would only post things about how much of a disaster I am in my life is. So lower expectations, sorry, adjust expectations. Um, ask for feedback. Uh, and that's where, you know, have a little pre-built form that students can drop in feedback, no expectations that you'll do anything with it. But if you have it, um, then you might be able to use it and adjust and see how you can improve. And finally, this bonus one, um, which is have boundaries. Don't be a rock star teacher. Uh, yeah, again, don't forget to go here. Um, the link is in the chat in a few different places, studyforge.net slash dlsimp21. Get this article, which has some more tools. It has um, tr some tips about Trello and some links as there to some systems as well. Um, and now we want to hear from you. So um, get ready to turn your cameras on and your voice on. No hiding from this section because we're gonna break you down into a few small groups. Now this um, slide here, we're gonna put in the shared document as well. So I'm gonna pop that in there. And then I'm going to send you off into groups and it'd be great if everyone could take notes. So I'm going to send you there for 10 minutes and then we'll come back for five minutes. And if each group could give like a quick two minute summary and I'll take some notes in the shared document of the things that you um, think and have been good or good tools for effective one-on-one -on -one coaching. Again, thinking about how we can individualize the learning experience for each of our students by just being us and care, caring about those kids. So I see lots of people running away before we get to the section. So for those who are brave enough to stick around and have a conversation with your colleagues, which is what conferences are for, come on people. Um, uh, let's do this. I need to, I'm just gonna stop the share so I can find the breakout room button easier. And looks like we're gonna have about eight groups and uh, they're open. So please hit join on your room and, and I'll Richard, let you know. Yeah. 10 minutes, did you say? 10 minutes, so at um, 12, yeah, I'll send out a, no a notice. At 12.08, we'll jump uh, back into the main room. Thank you. Richard, can I still join? Uh, I clicked the wrong button. I think so. Um, I'm not sure how to do that. Let me just try moving you to a different room and see if that works. Thanks. Did you get a notice to join the yeah, room? I, I do now, thank you. Okay, you're welcome.
Awesome. Welcome back, everybody. So we have seven minutes um, for those who stuck around. Hopefully someone did take some notes. Um, I took notes in, in my session that were really fantastic. So I'm just going to go in the bottom of that um, document or actually above the, I'm going to put it at the top because who cares about all this other stuff? Um, some ideas here. Oh, no, it's frozen. Now I'll try reloading. Okay, well, in the meantime, I'll just share from our group. I jumped in with um, Pam and Stephen, and uh, oh, come on, back to the shared dog. Okay, and uh, uh, Pam said she just phones all of her students to start, which is just a great way I thought to um, do that. And Stephen shared that he felt like that he does initial meeting with all of his students, and he finds it is time very well invested. We and then. Both of them kind of shared how, man, we wish there was some research that could show how, you know, the amount of of one-on-one -on -one time with a student affects course completion rates. I think we need some way, way, way more research in online learning as to course completion rates. We've done a little bit, and we actually will be publishing a white paper soon on um, success rates in one course in AP Calculus, but um, that's one course that we definitely need more data in online learning for sure. Um, and then one thing I felt that was really epic that should be added to the top of all of the lists um, was Pam said she works hard to try and alleviate students' expectation that the teacher needs them to be perfect. So I thought that was a really good one. I'm going to add that to the notes um, right now. So can we alleviate students' expectations that we as a teacher need them to be perfect? So that was our group. Um, anybody else uh, could jump in and share about some things that you guys came up with? I really like something, um, I was with Chelsea, uh, Stephen, and Kim, and one thing that Stephen mentioned was just talk about non-subject topics, things that can allow you to connect on a personal level, kind of along the same things that you uh, shared, um, Richard, but yeah, just nothing to do with the school or the subject, but a way to just connect outside. Um, I, I can share two here. Um, I was with uh, Brendan, Brandon, Deb, and Melanie, and um, we talked about a number of things. Uh, some of us are doing interviews with our students at the beginning of courses already. Um, Deb uses regular office hours, which she finds really helpful for connecting with students. Um, uh, um, Melanie teaches at a bunch of different levels, so she's using different engagement approaches depending on the level that she's working with. Um, and Brennan was doing some cool things with um, around student engagement and the kind of interactive uh, assignments that he was providing. Awesome. Thanks, Sally, Brennan, Deb, and Melanie. Those are good ones. I'm almost back to the doc and I'll pop these notes in there too. Anybody else want to share something that your group came up with that would benefit all of us? I really like knowing that you need different engagement levels per as per the level. That's a really good one. I think um, Tom. Oh, sorry. No, somebody else is speaking. Tom, you're off the hook. of a competition there. <laughs> um, so I met with Cheryl and Chris and um, one of the things, it was interesting because one thing that I would like to work on um, was also um, using more data for, um, for understanding my students and also contribute, like I, we do do an interview, but um, sometimes I go into a little bit cold, whereas um, Chris was mentioning how he uses like all the data available when he um, goes to speak to a student. So I was, I was uh, encouraged by that. And then um, we just talked about um, also just making ourselves a bit more approachable for students and um, take, making use of some of those journal um, journals that were mentioned before. And also um, contact with family. So, yeah.
Awesome. That's great. I like the, you know, potential of contacting and involving the family and thinking about that in there too. That's really, that's a really good thought. I was going to say, I, I, it didn't come up in my session, but I thought of it now is um, when we start the year, we do a 45 minute, I have a smaller class, just K to three, but we do mm -hmm. a 45 minute, go through the student learning plan with every subject, find out what the kids' um, passions are in the different areas of the subject. So um, I feel, and then I take notes in that meeting. So I feel like I really have a picture of, you know, what subjects they really enjoy, where they're struggling, even before we go into the year. So I find that really helpful. That's really good. So that's like, oh, because you have them for lots of subjects, you can do a, a much expanded kind of deep dive into their life and their world to, to have notes on afterwards. That's good. Um, I'm in a, in a very different boat where most of my students are in four classes in a brick and mortar school, plus them taking like one online with me. So a lot of them do not have time during the school day to, to have a face-to-face -face meeting with me. But I was talking with Tom and his idea, which I think might be able to work, is if I did a um, a video of me, like seeing them introducing myself when they first sign on to the course and then have them also record a video of themselves and just go through sort mm. of our, our, um, self-reflection intake program, but have it be video. And then if some students wanted to do a uh, conversation with me instead, like live, then they could do that as well. That's a good idea. So yeah, in cases where it doesn't necessarily work, um, to uh to find a different way to still get some of that connection opportunities that's awesome well it's 12 15 i'm not going to kick you out many people all also ran but thanks for being the brave few who would stick it out and actually be interactive in a session it's so good to connect with people and hear what you guys are doing and what's going on um so thanks everyone for coming if you want to stay in chat um, and add some more ideas or if you just want to drop your ideas in the uh shared document um, that would be fantastic uh, after today. So that uh, template, a possible template for an online meeting, we have that free resource to give away. That's in the shared doc as well. And I think these are being recorded. So hopefully all that's posted and there's lots that you can get help for. Don't forget to sign up and uh, get that article for free and hopefully win a Amazon gift card. Thanks everybody. Have a Thank fantastic session. Thank you so much, session. Richard. Yes, that was so great. And I really appreciated you building in the time for us to connect and share ideas. And yes, the session is recorded and will be available over the next week or so. And hope to see everybody this afternoon at the Demo Slam and in Kumo space. Go try it if you haven't tried it yet. Hey, bye all. Bye everyone. And Richard, before you sign off, we need to switch me back to host so that the recording uh, will save onto my account, which will go directly to the people that Did it work. Um, <laughs> uh, host me. Yeah, looks good. Okay. That was really be... super. Oh, thanks. That was fun. That one yeah. went, went well. Last yeah. time, my la first session, I didn't leave quite enough time. And so the breakout rooms kind of fell apart tried to do it yeah. in all in 10 minutes so this time i made sure yeah. we we're on track but I think that's helpful to, otherwise you know it's no that was like and your presentation was so good and like i love those things when it, it they're so important and there's diff, you, like you gave those extra I, ideas of how to make it happen you know, for me, it, there was not anything revolutionary, but it was still really applicable and helpful. And I like that. It's like, and it also like reinforces what you're doing of like, okay, yeah, when I feel like I just don't have time to do that. No, it really is worth it. I need to keep mm -hmm. doing it. Well, thanks. It's yeah. a pleasure. I try to, I, I enjoy practical sessions. So I do my best to make any of my sessions actually practical, pr yeah. practical that I can actually yeah. take it. There's, one thing that maybe I go, oh, that one thing that's helpful, or I hadn't didn't have that idea before. So yeah, totally worked. That's what these are Great. for. Thanks so much. Appreciate your help. Um, no problem. And facilitating.
Okay, I'll see, see you, you around. <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye.